We bid you welcome to our show. Let stories now be told of valor, lust, and treachery as heard in days of old, performed by artful vagabonds whose eloquence all would heed, those wandering sages known as bards, a proud flamboyant breed who once roamed Europe's time-worn lands whence listeners they'd cajole to stoke imagination's flames that smoldered in each soul. Something like this evening's first tale, the story of a robber of uh, years past, an intrepid thief, dashingly attired in elaborate gear, and of a dark-eyed woman that he loved, the landlord's daughter, who waited patiently for her man, watching for him through the casement of the window as she braided or plaited a uh, love knot into her long black hair, and the third character, the stable boy, otherwise known as an ostler, uh, who is infatuated with the dark-eyed woman. These are the characters you will meet in our first saga known as the highway. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwaymen came riding, riding, riding. The highwaymen came riding up to the old dim door. He'd a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin, a coat of the claret velvet and breeches of brown doe skin. They fitted with never a wrinkle. His boots were up to the thigh and he rode with a jewel twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle, under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard, and he tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plating a dark red love knot into her long black hair. And dark in the old inn yard, a stable wicket creaked where Tim, the ostler, listened. His face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like moldy hay. But he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter, Dumb as a dog, he listened, and he heard the robber say, One kiss, my bonny sweetheart, I am after a prize tonight, but I will be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet if they press me sharply and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He rose upright in his stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand, but she loosened her hair in the casement. His face burnt like a brand as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling over his breast, and he kissed its waves in the moonlight. Oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight. Then he tugged at his rein in the moonlight and galloped away to the west. He did not come in the dawning. He did not come at noon. And out of the tawny sunset before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon looping the purple moor, a redcoat troop came marching, marching, marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord. They drank his ale instead, but they gagged his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casements with muskets at their side. There was death at every window and hell at one dark window, for Bess could see through the casement the road that he had ride. They had tied her up to attention with many a sniggering jest 
They bound a musket beside her with the barrel beneath her breast. Now keep good watch. And they kissed her. She heard the doomed man say, look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the moonlight, and the hours crawled by like years, till now, on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger, at least, was hers. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up she stood, up to attention, with the barrel beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing. She would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Clack, 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 clack. Had they heard it? The horse hooves ringing clear. Clack, 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 clack. In the distance, were they deaf but did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwaymen came riding, riding, riding. The redcoats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still. Clit clot in the frosty silence. Clit clot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her. her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast with the moonlight, and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the west. He did not know who stood, bowed with head over the muskets, drenched in her own red blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, his face grew gray to hear how best the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shrieking a curse to the sky, with his white robe smoking behind him and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs in the golden noon. Wine red was his velvet coat. When they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway with a bunch of lace at his throat. And still of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, 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 a highwayman comes riding up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard. And he taps with his whip on the shutters and all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window. And who should be waiting there but Bess, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. The Highway, then, ladies and gentlemen, published in 1906 by Alfred Noyes, who uh, was born in England, raised in Wales, and spent much time in uh, the United States of America. Thank you for coming out today. So nice for all of us to be back at the University of Minnesota in Duluth in the year 2021. Uh, we, we missed last year, didn't we? Huh? Yeah. Um, that was narrative verse, by the way, and they'll be doing some more of that. Some of it under duress. <laughs> um, the next poem I'm going to uh, just give you a little introduction to, I'm calling it The Flea. And this seemingly silly poem is actually a poetic reworking of a brief excerpt 
from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Do we know the name Goethe, G-O-E-T-H-E? His great dramatic tale, Faust. And that long narrative poem was originally written unrhymed uh, and is based on the medieval legend of a man who was tempted to sell his soul to the devil. Uh, the notion of a compact pact with Satan first became popular in the Middle Ages. Uh, the scene takes place in a tavern where Faust, the hero of the story, and uh, the devil go to negotiate Faust's fate. As neither of them has any money, the devil tells this story to amuse the gullible barflies who then pay for the, uh, for the pair's beverages. Uh, uh, this version was first published in 1790 and is often regarded as Germany's greatest work of literature. So I'm trying to do good things here, although you may not catch it from this. The flea. Once on a time there was a king who had a handsome flea, dearer to him than anything, even his son was he. To wait his royal pleasure, the tailor then he bade, go make him clothes to measure and breeches for the lad. In silks the most expensive, the youngster now was dressed with ornaments extensive and ribbons on his breast. He held important stations as minister of state, and all his poor relations were placed among the great. The court was then a scene, sir, the ladies and the knights, the wardrobe and the queen, sir, they all had plaguey bites and weren't allowed to scratch them because of etiquette but we can grab and catch him and kill the little pet, the flea, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you. I had to do that um, because of the mention of the word etiquette, and the next poem that I'm going to do is, uh, also has the same name.